my name is Perryman from Ted Jacob. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Grish regarding the, uh, the structural uh, girder you have in your tower. Um, obviously, the, that uh, huge, gigantic girder you have, uh, you said you have used the strut and tide system for the, and you have the post tensioning cables running. Um, by knowing the fact that India is a high seismic zone like Iran, uh, I'm, as a structural engineer, I'm always concerned about the um, post tensioning in the connection. I just want to know uh, what, how did you define that? You know, for the connection is coming because you use the post tensioning plus the strut and tide. Did you look at that in the because uh, the main structural action is strut and tie. The post tensioning uh, is used predominantly for monolithic action of the uh, segmental construction of the uh, girders. Uh, post tensioning is not acting uh, in, uh, in 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 uh, lateral uh, load uh, resistance. It's just for the limiting the deflection. Exactly. Of the exactly. Okay. And did uh, and and uh, and also to limit the lateral thrust on the columns due to the strut tie action. The reinforcement in the lower uh, lower uh, cord, uh, we augmented its uh, efficiency by using the post tension cable. Didn't PT process slowing the construction? You know process because uh, that nine meters uh, girder plus PT to because each stage you have to go and didn't slow the process of the construction. Uh, no, in fact, what happened was, um, see, the uh, the uh, the configuration of the girder, that is, the design of the girder, came into picture as the load went on increasing. Mm -hmm. So uh, the tensioning of the cables was sequential. So we uh, uh, stressed the cables after every seven floors. Okay. So as the construction was going up, the tensioning of the cables was going on. So it it was a parallel activity. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, next question. Maybe I, I have one question for the panel. You know, uh, this Congress is talking about the tall buildings and uh, the, in a the different part of the world, uh, sounds like we have a lot of projects. Uh, it's like a competition on the height. And uh, we remember, you know, back to the 100 years ago, the, the tallest building is around 100 meter. Now it's already exceeding one kilometer. So in your opinion, will there be a limitation in terms of technology or economic, the ultimate height, height of the tall buildings? Uh, let me try to answer that. About uh, 1985, I think it was, I was called by the president of the American Concrete Institute to give a talk on how tall can a concrete building can you build. Uh, luckily for us, in those days, there was a recession in the United States and nobody had any work. So I got together a group of architects, engineers, contractors, and we designed a building. And just to pick a target, we designed a building 1,600 meters high. And it was a full-fledged design. I, I can give you all the details if you want. It was 377 floors in height. It had uh, 39 million square feet in area. Uh, the base was 150 meters by 150 meters. Uh, it, was it was designed for Chicago just because the conference was in Chicago. Uh, but we proved two things at the time. One was even with the technology we had back in 1985, we could build a building that tall without any trouble. Uh, second, the, the cost of the building was the big problem. It was, in those days, it was costing $8 billion dollars to build that tower. And the construction time was four and a half years. Now, the people who are financially based will tell you that to carry a risk of $8 billion and wait for five years for a return is a very difficult problem. Only shakes and uh, people with a lot of money can do that sort of stuff. So it's, uh, it's not a technology issue, it's a financial issue. That's the bottom line. If today you wanted me to design a building 2,000 meters tall, I know how to do it. It's not difficult. 
But the question is, who's got the deep pockets to be able to do that? Thank you. You know, we had a conference at Tongji University a couple of years ago, and uh, a, a number of students a asked me uh, this after sort of talking about Chicago. Um, they're they're thinking that the tall buildings like Jin Mao and World Financial Center were they sustainable or not? Uh, and my answer uh, was, well, if I didn't see these tall buildings, I'd have a hard time sometimes getting around Shanghai if I didn't have that reference point uh, of the tall buildings. And I think, like anything else, um, and to answer your question, you know, yes, we, we, you know, there is a technology to do it. Um, in fact, the project you're talking to, you know, sounds like Frank Lloyd Wright's Illinois Tower, you know. Um, uh, which is interesting, you know, because that was developed at the time of Iron Goldsmith is, you know, developing, you know, the, the, uh, the true sort of structure for a tall building. But the, um, I think this is the importance of planning and the importance of how do you make a great city? Let's not talk about tall buildings. Let's say, how do you make a great city, a great livable city? And then... How does a tall building reinforce that on every level, whether it's, you know, the center of mass transportation, uh, whether it, you know, it um, is the center of culture, you know, what, what does it, role does it fulfill to make a better sort of collective? And I think those are the questions we should be asking uh, first, and then we use technology to solve that problem on every level you know, which we, we, which we do have. And I think that's uh, what I'm kind of getting from this conference is, and I think that it's, it's reinforced in this connection between our cities and our tall buildings and the quality of those tall buildings. I'm actually very, very encouraged by the fact that on every level, whether it's, you know, whether it was, you know, your project, you know, which I think was magnificent, you know, in terms of what it was doing, it's very, very different. When we're talking about Manila, how do you make a great city? You know, those are the questions you guys are asking. Uh, and I think that's, you know, to sort of end up in the, you know, in the conference here, I think that's what we need to do on, an, on every level, whether it's the government or whether it's the institutions or whether it's the practitioners, always looking to make a better city. Thank you, Chris. If, if I may look back, uh, 1977 till 1981, I, I worked for the ruler of Dubai, and Dubai at that time was uh, the third, fourth world. And the ruler of Dubai just gave us, we were about 20 architects planners from 14 countries. And the ruler of Dubai just gave us five instructions. One is bring Dubai from the fourth world into the first world in 15 years. I think they were, they were able to do it in, in, in 10 years. Then one thing I liked very much was for every year of service, one month, you go around the world and copy. I think that was my first exposure to benchmarking. In 1977, they, they built the tallest structure in the Middle East, 39 stories. Now with uh, Burj Khalifa, it's, I think, 160 stories. And I think it's really the, the political will. In early discussions at uh, the plenary this morning, and for the panelists, yeah, Kathy is here. They were asked, which the next tallest building? And everybody, the two said it's going to be China. I tend to believe it will be Abu Dhabi or Qatar. Because they, they have deep pockets and they're all competing for the sky. And early discussions also, one panel discussion on the first day, I think. The structural engineers, they said, who were in that panel, they can build up to 3,000 meters, 3 kilometers, structurally. But the MEPs, mechanical engineers, uh, MEP and fire protection, they say at 828 meters, that's the, the Dubai, it's very, very challenged, the mechanical, electrical, and so on. But the elevator ring, it's like a vertical, vertical train. So there, it's really the MEP and fire protection. After 9-11, in our class at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, they were reviewing the, the fire protection because there, there was a proposal to widen the, the fire stairs and it would eat up into more saleable space. 
And in our class, uh, handled by Eugene Cohn of KPF, he asked our class, and I suggested that maybe if you try to imagine what happened in 9-11, maybe those who were going down were all clinging on the wall, and nobody must have been using the middle of the stairs. So I, I suggest that why don't we just do like a giant slide in theme park and slide down. So uh, it's really political will, I think, the, the will to do it, and, and technology will follow. Uh, I have something to say about this as well. Uh, political will is one thing. Um, but <clears throat> as I say it, uh, there are some island cities in the world uh, like Mumbai and New York and Hong Kong where uh, there is a shortage of space. And if I remember, I mean, from my child childhood to now, Mumbai had um, a density of uh, buildings with, uh, let's say, six to seven stories about uh, 25 years ago uh, and very few tall buildings. But now, uh, because of shortage of space, uh, the average height of the building in terms of number of floors has gone up to 22, which means uh, the uh, requirement of tall buildings is rising. And as these buildings are getting taller, like 800 meters and 1,000 meters, the technology is being pushed up and up. It's like uh, space technology, you know, space travel technology. You uh, go to extreme frontiers, but the technologies that you employ there are then used uh, in day-to-day -day life to make uh, lives of uh, you know public uh, easier. So similarly, the uh, the technologies that we are using in tall buildings like MEP and uh, vertical transportation and uh, facade cleaning and so many other things, those will be easily used for mass housing, which uh, which is rising up and up. That's uh, that's how I look at this uh, pushing the frontier of uh, tall buildings further and further. Thank you very much. So, next question. Hi, question for, for Chris. Uh, really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Um, my name is Robin Cheese Wright, and the company is D2E International. Uh, we're elevator consultants. And I, I know um, when it comes to educational establishments uh, and designing the vertical transportation in educational establishments, so kind of rule of thumb is always to have the lecture theatres and the seminar rooms as low as possible. So in effect, you don't have to move lots of large, uh, large numbers of people quickly. Yeah. Um, but I noticed in your design that the, the lecture theatres, etc., were two thirds of the way up the building. So I guess my, my question is, do we have a situation here where the design criteria are wrong? Or um, are, are, do you actually find now you're, uh, the building's built, you have uh, do, do you incur any people flow problems? Okay, hey, uh, well that's a really great question uh, because that was our, when we started out, that was actually our first inclination is to have all the lecture halls, all the assembly spaces lower. And actually it's not two thirds, it's about, you know, the second quarter, or second third of the building. But what was important to the university, and this is, um, uh, was that when they walked in, that, that was the front door of the building. So what they're trying to do is recruit students. And they wanted to make sure that the admissions, the registrar, and the connective quality of the university, the out-of-class spaces, because it's both people who are living on campus and also commuter students, that they sort of occupied, sort of, they came up from the street. And we actually had a lot of, you know, we, we went through many, many different types of stackings and, you know, rated those. Um, and, and we talked about the stress on the vertical transportation. Um, but as we worked with our transportation consultants, who've worked on many of the buildings that, that you've seen here, um, you know, and we talked about then the issue of how you then connect the floors and the fact that especially if you have like a college of business in a zone and a college of sciences in a zone and, and some general e education that students will generally be between and different sort of coursework between two or three different floors. It would tend not to use the elevators. And it's actually, you know, we're just in our first two months of operation right now. It opened up in May, you know, September, you know, the classes. And there's actually, there's only one time when the elevator system is stressed, and that's like right after lunch. But other than that, everything works. 
Um, but we went through that quite a bit because obviously when you're talking about a vertical circulation, a vertical university and, and all these connective zones which have to all interconnect, that becomes one of the principal issues. Um, and, and that's why we talked about things like on a small site, taking the exit stairs, making them bigger, making them transparent, make them easy for people to go from one level to another. It's like every component of what you're doing has to somehow have that connective quality. So, um, good question. Now the advantage, the advantage of having the classrooms a little higher is once you raise up and you're in the middle of what is one of the most beautiful cities in the world, you'll never see a classroom like that. It's not the dull classroom <laughs> that you normally associate with, you know. And so, what sort of some of the disadvantage, yes, it takes you a little longer, but when you're there, people stay there. And so, you know, we went back and forth on that issue quite a bit. And that, because that is a key component of doing this, especially on such a tight site. Uh, Skidmore's in Merrill is doing actually a very similar project in New York City. Uh, it's, uh, it's for the new school, it's on 14th Street and 5th Avenue, but they've got a site that's twice as wide. Um, and, and they don't have the restrictions uh, that we have, and so, and but it's an interesting project because they, they really express that circulation between floors. I think it'll be a very successful project. Uh, but that's kind of the key, is figuring out how to make that work. The Roosevelt University follows more closely what a tall building model can do. You, you know, think about you know a tall building model. So I think there's an interesting contrast between those two. So.